are going to get ready to roll here. Okay, so today we are talking about what can we diagnose using iridology. And you know, every, every clock in my world has a different time on it. We're gonna get this about another 30 seconds because the computer I'm on right now says 10.59, my other ones say 11. And Passiflora Gold, you're in Ireland, welcome. Welcome, good to have you with us. And we've got people joining us on the webinar from all over North America as well. So that is great, really great. This is a good time for you in Ireland, isn't it? Because it's early evening. It's not like midnight or 2 a.m., which would be a really awful time to do this. All right, so here we are. We are going to be talking about what can we diagnose with iridology. And this is an important topic. If you've been with me, if you've been hanging out with me for any length of time, you know I've got two missions in my, my life and in my business. Uh, in my business, it's I mentor practitioners who are struggling in their businesses because they spend their own time unpaid and after hours creating client programs and I teach the truth about iridology and its proper application in a wellness practice. So with that in mind, let's dive into today's topic. What can we diagnose with iridology? First, let's look at the word diagnosis and see what it actually means. To diagnose means to name a disease. So you go to a doctor or naturopath, they run tests, they analyze the results, they name the disease, and then they create the treatment protocol from the disease name. Now that's not a bad thing to do, but we have to remember that the stats suggest that diagnostic errors occur in at least 20% of all cases. And this is based on autopsy reports as reported in the British Medical Journal volume 22 and issue supplement two. So maybe as holistic practitioners, we don't really want to name diseases. Maybe we've heard, um, and we've all heard of the case studies where once the disease label was attached, people were unable to shake it loose. And it meant that they, the doctors would not look at any other alternative. And so it's really important for us to recognize that mm, as holistic practitioners, it's not really important for us to name a disease, right? It's important for us to understand the pathway of the processes that are happening in the body. So let's look at some iris photos and see what we see here. Specifically, we are going to look at one case of medically diagnosed ADHD, and we're gonna look at four cases of PCOS and one of sphincter of Audi dysfunction. But just before we do that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself because some of you are new to me and that is a lot of fun. My name is Judith Cobb. Hello, Emma Rubio. It is so good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am an IPA certified iridologist and I am also an IPA certified iridology teacher. And so that's very cool. So you know that I'm not just someone who studied and read a book and am you know, sharing what I learned in the book. This is years of training and exams and passing um, standardized tests to make sure that I was, that I knew my stuff and was good enough to do this. But I want to start with why I got in to holistic healing. Back when I was in my late teens, I had some health problems and it was interesting that the doctors could not find an answer. They kept running tests and and giving me information, but it was stuff I already knew. They weren't narrowing it down and isolating it to really what the problems were. And so I got frustrated and I started looking at alternatives. Actually, that was about when I met my husband and um, his mom was into holistic stuff. So I started talking with her and I started talking with my husband to find my, my boyfriend at that point in time to find out what they knew. And I started following that pathway. And that was how I started to learn about iridology and herbology. Since then, I've become a master herbalist, a certified iridologist, as you see here, actually from about three different schools, a certified comprehensive iridology instructor, um, a nutritionist, a nutrition coach from several different schools as well. I've been in the industry now for 40 years, yeah, four decades, celebrated that this year, yay, go me, and, and uh 
and I've written a ton of books over the years. I've self-published a lot of books, Pregnancy Naturally, the Herbal Birth Kit Handbook, Healthy Kits Naturally, The Essential Guide to Nature Sunshine Products, Biokinesiology and Color Therapy Level 1 and Level 2, and the Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology Textbook, which is the book that I, I use when I'm teaching my iridology program. I have also created and taught many courses. I've taught a Herbology Level 1 that was 20 hours of herbal training for home use, Herbology Level 2, which was 16 hours of advanced herbal training for home use, Biokinesiology and Color Therapy at Level 1 and Level 2. I, at one point in my life, was a certified prenatal educator um, with, mm, yeah, I should remember the name of that organization because I was with them for many years, but I don't. I also um, created the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System, which is an IPA approved iridology course. Stay with me to the end of today's workshop to learn more about the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System course that will be starting up again in January. In the meantime, are you ready to look at some eyes with me? Hello, Annie and Chrissy. Good to have you with us on Instagram. Are you ready? Let's take a look. This is the first thing we, the first case we're going to look at. Now, again, what we're really doing here is we are looking at what can we diagnose, if anything, and of what value is what we see in the eyes if we are not going to attach a disease name to the process. Okay, so as we look at this and we look at these lovely eyes, and for those of you who are on Instagram, I'm going to move my camera closer. It will be handheld, which is going to be a little bit seasickish for you, I'm sure. Whoops, that's not quite where I meant to go. Just let me get my slide back. There we go. All righty. So here we have it. This is um, a case of a 10 year old boy whose parents brought him into me. He had been diagnosed with ADHD and the, the parents wanted to keep him off Ritalin, which of course is just street legal speed, um, which is not what we really want to do to kids, but we understand the chemistry of why it works. And when we understand that chemistry of why speed works, why an amphetamine works to help people with ADHD function, it helps us to understand what we can do nutritionally to support them instead. And so what we want to pay attention to here is all of these rings that go around in this little boy's eyes and these lines that radiate outward. Okay, this is what we call an anxiety tetanic subtype. Now, it's interesting to note that while um, most children who have a medical diagnosis of ADHD have these markers, have these rings and these radiating lines, not all people who have these markers have ADHD. Does that make sense? So you can have these, these markers in your eyes and not have ADHD, but it's very, very common for us to see these markers in people who do have ADHD. So these markers suggest that this person may burn through B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium very quickly. And when they are properly nourished for their needs, they like to have to-do lists and a direction in what they are doing. And they like to accomplish things, right? So, I mean, um, yes, I have contraction froze and there's my I call this my day book. That's my list of what I need to get done today. Like, like Superman couldn't get it done, but that's okay. What doesn't get done today, I'll get put on tomorrow's list. This set of markers is not enough to diagnose a person with ADD or ADHD. Okay, and as iridologists, we cannot legally diagnose anything anyway, but we can ask questions. And because we understand what these particular markings mean to how this person's chemistry works, how their body actually works, we have insight. So we ask questions like, what are this child's sleep patterns? How does he handle stress and frustration and anxiety? What is his favorite learning method? And when we're looking at someone who's got ADHD, their favorite learning method is probably kinesthetic. They probably like to have their body involved. Once their body is involved in the learning, they can often learn auditorially. So they're doing what they're doing with their hands and their body, but they can listen better when their body is involved. Okay, so what we needed to do with this young boy is we needed to teach him 
to use his body more. So we got permission from his teacher for him to keep some bendable, posable figures inside his desk. And so what that meant is that when the teacher was talking and wanted him to pay attention, he would just reach inside his desk and would start playing with this little toy that made no noise, totally quiet. And because his body was now doing something, he could pay attention better. Now that was a part of what we did. We also did some supplements with him because what we need is this, this little boy needs the right kinds of B vitamins. He needs the right format of calcium, magnesium, and vitamin C. He also needs protein at the right times of day to stabilize blood sugars because erratic blood sugars often go with ADHD. And so there's so many other imbalances that can add to the story of ADHD. But as soon as I saw these circles and these radiating lines, I knew what we needed to do with him to start. Now, interesting that um, his mother, hello, Brendan, good to see you. His, his mother broke her ankle just a few minutes, a few minutes, no, thankfully not a few minutes, a few months after we started working together. And so she was laid up in a cast, was not able to wait there on her foot whatsoever. So she was basically stuck in a chair or in bed all day. And so as she was bored out of her mind, she asked him if he would like to come and play a game of old maid. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that little card game that we play with children. And so he said, yes. And she thought, okay, well, this will kill about three and a half minutes because normally in the past, he would, he would get distracted partway through the first game and he would wander off and it would be over. Well, they made it through the first game. Hmm. And then he said, can we play again, mom? And she goes, yeah, sure. So they played a second game. And then they got partway through a third game at his request before he lost interest. Now she was absolutely amazed at what making a few dietary changes and a few adding a few supplements to his program had done for his ability to focus. This is one of my clients who came to me with a medical diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at three more cases of this and you're going to see how different their eyes are. There's not one specific eye type that says, oh, this woman probably has fertility issues and probably PCOS. Hi, Ace Gold Cali. I hope I said that right. Welcome join, for joining us on, on Instagram. Good to see you there. And so as we look at these, you know, some of these women have certain kinds of imbalances and some of them have other imbalances that all take us to polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so this is a really important thing. Now, this client had a history of gaining weight. Um, about five months before she got married, she started putting on weight and she put on like nearly 60 pounds in five months. It was really astonishing to watch. Her menstrual cycles were getting further and further apart, which is very hallmark for PCOS. When we look at her eyes, she is what we call a polyglandular subtype. And so she's got a lot of lacunae that correlate um, to hormonal imbalance and to a predisposition of hormonal imbalance and to a predisposition of blood sugar imbalances. And she was eating very poorly. She was eating a lot of very high carbohydrate foods. So as we looked at her eyes and we understood what her diet was like and what her cycles were like, and she'd been to the doctor and he'd said, yes, it's PCOS but he couldn't tell her what to do with it except suggest the birth control pill, which of course does absolutely no good whatsoever. We took this young lady and we really cleaned up her diet. She knew that after she got married, she wanted to have children. So she cleaned up her diet. Oh my goodness, she cleaned up her diet. She lost that 60 pounds in five months and it wasn't because she was starving herself. It was because she was eating correctly. She took the weight off, her periods regulated, and she went on to have four successful pregnancies. Now look at this eye really carefully and see what we see here. And let's look at the next one because this is another medically confirmed case of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, this young woman and her husband came to me. They'd been trying to get pregnant for about three years and they'd had no luck. And the doctors had said to her, yes, you have 
type 2 diabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Here, take metformin and we'll do Clomid with you. They only had, of course, drug answers. There was no dietary work whatsoever. Her menstrual cycles were 75 days apart, and but she didn't have a weight problem. She's a petite little Asian lady and really, um, you know, I mean, to look at her, you would not know that she had PCOS until you start getting her symptoms. And then when you look at her eyes and you see she's got those rings going around. Now, in that little boy we looked at who had ADD, ADHD, he had these rings too. And remember what they meant is that he didn't handle his B vitamins and vitamin C and calcium and magnesium very well. He needed more of them in the right format. Well, the same is true when we're looking at PCOS. So this darling lady and her husband came in. Her husband was such a sweetheart. And as I'm asking, um, how does she handle stress? He kind of chuckled. They're both accountants. They work in, at different businesses. And he said, yeah, I always know when she's at a month end or a year end or a quarterly report because I know that my job then is to make sure supper is ready when she gets home to feed her, run a hot bath for her and just leave her alone. She doesn't do stress well. And I thought that was cute. And he was so loving and sweet about how he would take care of her to help her through her stress, in spite of the fact that he probably had the same stresses because he was also an accountant. So again, we needed to get the B vitamins into her in the right format because we know in unbalanced Bs can lead to blood sugar problems and can lead to craving carbs. And so we started with that and we started revamping her diet. She had a really, really high carb hybrid diet that was a combination of the worst of, of Hong Kong and the worst of North America. And so we needed to do a complete cleanup, which was great. Her husband said, I'll make sure she eats it. I'll, do, I'm, I'll take over the cooking. I'll prepare all the, all the foods. I could probably stand to lose 10 pounds as well. And so, you know, they did this together, which was brilliant. When we got her diet on track, knowing, and when we got her on the right B vitamins, those are the two keys here. Um, we got her cycles down from 75 days to 35 days, which was amazing because a 75 day cycle is an infertile cycle. A 35 day cycle has potential. She did go on to get pregnant and had a very healthy pregnancy. She did not develop gestational diabetes. They were very afraid she would because of her type two diabetes diagnosis, but she did not develop gestational diabetes. We were so excited. She delivered a healthy seven pound baby boy at term. Okay, so that is another example of PCOS. Now, is there anything specifically in here that says to me, she has PCOS? No, there's not. But are there things here that when I understand what her menstrual cycle is doing and what her diet is doing, that help me to understand what we need to do to get her back on track? Absolutely there are. And that is part of the reason why it's so important as an iridologist, why we understand anatomy and physiology really well. If you don't know anatomy and physiology, knowing iridology is really not useful. This is another young lady. She was about 20 when she came to see me the first time. Now, she has a very special mark in her eye. And I hope those of you who are with me on Instagram can see this. Can you see right here? It kind of looks like a lacuna, but it's not. We're going to look at this exact fiber right here. We're going to look at it blown up. Can you see how this fiber actually lifts right off the eye? It casts a shadow. This is a shadow, but it lifts right off the eye. This is called a gateway arch. Now, this young lady came to me because she was 20. She was in university. She was gaining weight, and she did not want to gain weight. What 20-year-old woman does, right? So I asked her about her diet really high carb diet. She was eating on campus in the cafeteria on the meal plan. And we all know what that's like, right? So we asked about her, I asked about her lifestyle and there was no physical activity. She would walk to her classes. She lived on campus. So there was really no physical activity. What got my attention though, was that her menstrual cycles were 60 days apart, which according uh, to all of the medical parameters, any time the cycles are routinely over 45 days apart, that's the first indicator of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so 
um, she'd been to her doctor about the weight and about the periods and they'd said that it was fine. There was nothing going on and I'm going, holy doodle. And so um, we decided that we needed to take action here. And the, what we needed to do was we needed to get her diet under control. Being a student, she didn't have money for supplements and I totally understand what that's like. So we really worked with her foods. And we suggested that she, since she had access to a kitchen in her dorm, that she should be not eating on the campus program all day, every day, but that she should be doing proteins at breakfast, that she needed to have more leafy greens, she needed protein at lunchtime. And uh, the closest grocery store, she was in the States, was about two miles away. So I suggested that twice a week she needed to walk to the grocery store, get her protein and her fresh veggies and bring them back and then prepare her breakfast and lunches on her own and then be more careful with what she was choosing in the cafeteria um, for supper. As we got her doing that, we found that her menstrual cycles started to even out and that her weight stopped increasing and started to come off. So all of these three sets of eyes had really significant hormonal imbalances, polycystic ovarian syndrome. But did you see how their eyes were all very different? And it's not a case, again, of one marker equals one problem. It's a situation that we have to understand what the markers can mean. We have to understand the woman's health history, what the problems are she wants help with, and when we have that and we look at her eyes, then we can understand why her body's doing what it's doing. And we also then understand what we can do to help her get things back under control. Is that all making sense for you? Is that all fitting? Another case of infertility. Now this was not specifically um, PCOS, I do a lot of fertility work. That's why I have so many fertility cases to talk about. This lady and her husband had been trying to get pregnant for about a year. They'd had no luck. And she has some very tiny markers that don't, can't show up well on the size of slides and, and, the, and over Instagram with my phone camera. Um, but she's got a, some tiny markers that suggest she has, um, that she needs her B vitamins in a specific form. It suggested to me that she might have the MTHFR defect. Now, for those of you who are familiar with that, great. Those of you who are not, it means that uh, like about half of North Americans have this problem, males and females both. And it means that the liver cannot methylate the B vitamins properly. And if the B vitamins don't get methylated, they don't get used. So we don't get the benefit of having those B vitamins in our body. So I figured from looking at her eyes that she probably had the MTHFR defect. We worked with her, got, and she got pregnant, which was brilliant. And she's a very nervous Nellie, um, very anxious about everything. I spent more time talking her down from being totally off the charts anxious. That's okay. That's my job. We talked her down every time. Halfway through the pregnancy, she did 23 and me. And her results from that came back and she sent me an email that was just vibrating with anxiety. And she said in it that 23andMe had come back and she tested positive for MTHFR. Her concern was, would her baby be healthy? Had she done, should she have not gotten pregnant because she has MTHFR? And I was able to say, I've had your back since the get go. I suspected this from our very first meeting from the day I took your eye photos. And so I've been addressing this as if I knew you had that problem. So there's nothing to worry about. Anything that can be prevented, we've done what we need to do. And that really brought her back down. Now, again, she didn't have PCOS. She's got some indicators that she might be prone to a little bit of blood sugar imbalance, a little bit of hormonal imbalance right, and MTHFR, and you can see she's got little bits of these rings in her eyes, which we would see better if we didn't have frontal lighting. If I only had one light on, we'd see a lot more of those lines, but we've got some down here as well. We've got some more up here. So a bit of a nervous Nelly. Um, but again, we can't tell from looking at her eyes that she has PCOS. 
but we can tell what we need to do to help her be more calm, to help her uh, get pregnant when we understand her symptoms. One of her symptoms was she had almost no menstrual flow. Like as she said, her menstrual flow was a smear on the tissue for two or three days. She didn't even use a panty liner, right? Which says there's not enough endometrial lining, which says she doesn't have enough estrogen and progesterone. And so we really had to work with that, but her doctors didn't see it that way, which absolutely surprised me. And so we did what we needed to based on what we saw in her eyes and based on what her symptoms were to get her to, um, to be able to conceive. Sphincter of Audi. Now, this is a really interesting problem because this was a client who'd been with me for many years. And then as most clients do, he disappeared for a few years and then he resurfaced. And he said in the years that he had been gone, he had had his gallbladder removed. And now he had what his research suggested was sphincter of Audi dysfunction. So let's take a look at what this really means. Here we have the liver and the liver connects to this bile duct right here and the liver produces bile and the bile is backwashed into the gallbladder. When we eat fatty foods that need to be broken down, where the fats need to be broken down, the gallbladder is supposed to squirt the bile out, send it down this tube into the small intestine. Now, right here is the sphincter of Audi and it is supposed to regulate the flow of bile down this duct. When the gallbladder is removed, because it's got gallstones typically, and we can talk about what causes gallstones in another episode, but what happens is a lot of people who've had their gallbladder removed end up with a sphincter of Audi dysfunction. And it's not understood why this happens, uh, whether it is scar tissue that starts to close down the sphincter of Audi or whether it is muscle spasm. At any rate, he was in some serious trouble with this and he was wondering if I could help him. The first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see if there was anything in his eyes that suggested that he should have this problem. So when we look at his right eye and when we look at the gallbladder region, which sits at about eight o'clock right in here, there is nothing significant that says inherently he should have a gallbladder problem. Now, so why did he end up with this if inherently genetically there was no reason for it? There was no programming for it. We'd have to know this man. This man is one of the kindest, gentlest, really kindest and gentlest is the best way to describe it. Gentleman I have ever met. He's in his late fifties and he is so oh my goodness, just so thoughtful and so sweet in so many ways. I can see why his wife absolutely adores him. And uh, he, he has a job where there's a lot of frustration and a lot of um, pushback to everything he does. He's an inspector, he's a health and safety inspector for industry. And so there's always a lot of pushback. There's always a lot of bureaucratic red tape. There's a lot of, of tension in the job. And he takes that anger and he buries it. He doesn't work it out. He just buries it and keeps being nice. He never lets anyone have it, so to speak. And so that goes to the gallbladder and that creates gallstones. And so when we talked about this, when he came in after he has gallbladder removed, we talked about how he stuffs his anger and he just laughed because he knew I was right. And it was like, okay, well, we, you got to stop doing that. It's not going to help you just because your gallbladder's out doesn't mean the problem is resolved. The symptom is resolved, but the problem is not resolved. The problem is that you got to not stuff your anger. We got to teach this old dog some new tricks. All right. So there's no real suggestion of gallbladder tendencies here. And because it, because of that, and because we just don't know what to do with sphincter of Audi, we weren't able to do anything to help him, right? Um, I think we suggested magnesium to relax it in case it is a spasm. We suggested aloe vera juice in case it is scar tissue, because that can help a little bit. I think we had him massaging frankincense on his abdomen as well, but you know, it's, it's, he did that for several months and saw no result. And so I don't know that there's anything that we can do. I know that the medical world can go in and they can work on dilating that. Um, 
but it's not proven to have a long standing effect. So that can be just kind of a bit of nastiness for very little gain. All right. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us with iridology? If we can't diagnose, where does it leave us? You know, it doesn't matter if you're a herbalist or a nutrition coach or an aromatherapist or a naturopath. Um, you know, it leaves us in the position of an iridology assessment can guide us as to what our clients actually need to help them resolve the issues they've got. And this is important because what I see online is a lot of iridologists who are diagnosing, you know, people post their photos on social media all over the place, right? Their eye photos and say, tell me what's wrong. And then you get people taking the bait and doing an analysis without having any case history. And just speaking in broad generalities, literally bombarding the person with so much information that the person actually can't use it all. You know, too much information, truly information overload. It's really important for us as iridologists to remember that iridology is not a crystal ball. It is not a party game. It is a wellness assessment tool. So the answer to is iridology diagnostic tool is absolutely no. We actually cannot diagnose anything from the eyes because that iridology is an assessment tool. Iridology teaches us what questions to ask. Again, we need to know what the client's concerns are. We need to know a little bit about their health history, about what they're doing for their health. Then as we look at their eyes, we can understand why their body's doing what it's doing. And we can create a program that will help to take them to the next step. So iridology is an assessment tool that points the way to the questions we should ask. It is a guide. It is a guide. And with that, um, again, if you've been hanging out with me for any length of time, you know that I love mentoring practitioners who are struggling in their businesses because they're spending too much of their own time unpaid creating client programs. And you know from today even that I love teaching the truth about iridology. For the past several years, I've been teaching wellness practitioners like you the art and science of iridology, of constitutional iridology specifically. Registration for the next course that starts on January 28th is open now. And I'd love to take just a moment to share some of the details of that course with you. The dynamic iridology assessment system is. Uh, is the only live online fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care. So often when we talk about streamlining, we talk about giving things up, about doing less. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about how to use iridology to actually make you more precise, more efficient, and create rapport with your clients and understanding of your clients much more quickly. This is all so that you can stop working the unpaid overtime creating programs, get your programs created in your client sessions. It is, it'll help you stop overwhelming your clients with way too much information. It'll give them what they need to take them to the next step, not what they need for the rest of their life, because the rest of their life is a long time. And that increases client compliance and it creates long-term relationships. I have so many clients who've been with me for 30 to 40 years. I see them for four or five times and then they go off and do their homework for a few years and then they come back because their body has shifted and we rinse and repeat all along the way. The goal of the dynamic iridology assessment system is to teach you constitutional iridology and how to use it confidently so that you can easily integrate what you already know about nutrition and herbology to confidently create doable programs in your client sessions. Our next course is starting on Thursday, January 28th, but I am betting that you'd like a little more information, just not right now, right? You'd like to set some time aside to learn about the program. That's what I'm hoping. If you are interested in this, in learning more, I am doing an info webinar on December 10th. 
And if you will send me your email address, DM it to me either on Instagram, if that's where you're at, or if you're with me on, on the webinar, you can private message me there or send me an email. And I will send you the link to register for the info session that is happening on December 10th. In that session, not only will I introduce you to the class and what's involved in this course, what you get, what support you get, what the tuition is, what the payment plan is, all of the details so you can make a decision. I'm also going to give you four specific things that you can start doing right now that will help you to start getting your client programs done in less time. Right. So if that's of interest to you, then you really want to be uh, in with me at the info session on December 10th. Now, I might be able to do I actually have that link here. Um, let me just roll back in my notes and see. I don't I didn't put the link where I can grab it easily. So if you would like that link to join me on December 10th. No obligation. This is strictly an info session. Just send me your email address and I will make sure you get the invitation and the link. With that, my friends, thank you so much for being with me. I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Take good care and bye for now.